Do you use photographic images in any of your work, Jim? Yes, I use, uh, I make collages out of, from photographic images, and I, I paint, paint from them, but I, uh, I rarely use, a, I've used silk screens too, but I rarely do that. Your realistic images are obviously vehicles for conveying some kind of new visual information. What are your own primary tools, your own primary conceptual tools? During the Vietnam War, uh, the atmosphere was terrible. And uh, so what happens, and it happened in my work, poli political references have come in, uh, and I didn't take the time to throw them out. And that's why they occurred in, the, in my paintings. Uh, it's like working to throw out bad feelings. I, I remember I was uh, in 1968, I had a brand new studio and I was making a new painting called Horse Blinders, which meant going straight ahead. And then the <clears throat> assassinations began to occur and then I began to feel like I had a ball and chain around my ankle. I, my things changed and my, the whole painting changed. Leo, to what extent does your own aesthetic judgment influence the artists whose work you represent? I never try to influence uh, the painters uh, who are affiliated with my gallery in any possible way, telling them to, go to paint the small paintings because they are more sellable. He certainly, in that uh, respect, is the greatest sinner of them all. And there were no market uh, considerations. <laughs> there is no one who painted painting as large as his. Actually, uh, my gallery uptown uh, seemed to be the arena where he, <laughs> he really uh, went to town and uh, painted uh, uh, all the walls, uh, like in F-111, and then... Had to wrap around. He ra well, F-111, uh, you say that it's an 84-foot uh, painting, but that's just accidental. Mm -hmm. It's uh, wrapped around the gallery, and the gallery happened to, happens to have 84 feet yes. of uh, wall space. And then I covered the floor with the dry ice. That and then, uh, at <coughs> one point, he was not even satisfied with doing uh, the walls. He also did, uh, did the floor. <laughs> Of course, those paintings uh, seem to be hardly sellable, but they did sell uh, nevertheless because there are some imaginative collectors, thank God, very few of them, who do really uh, buy uh, those things. Uh, God knows why, but they do. <laughs> and uh, one of them uh, used to be Skull, whose uh, ambitions uh, were, collecting ambitions were boundless, and he's greatly to be admired for that. It's a pity that, uh, well, as everything uh, has a beginning, a middle, and an end, he, he wore out, uh, well, through various circumstances of his life. But another one who had the same uh, uh, gigantic approach to collecting and still is very active is Dr. Ludwig in, in Cologne, in Germany, who bought the other 84-foot painting called Horse Blinders that he just mentioned. Then he simmered down a little bit. He just... Uh, uh, made paintings that were merely occupied uh, the <laughs> long walls of the gallery, just uh, 24 foot or so each. My uh, association and affiliation <laughs> with Leo has been that he provides uh, a spirit and a help, and is, he's very, Leo's very generous. And uh, I find out how generous he is when I, as I meet more and more people who newly become involved in art and interested in art. So. Uh, <laughs> My life has been like a roller coaster, up and down and down and up. And during the terrible times, he's <clears throat> been been uh, very, very helpful. And uh, I th that's that's what I think. That's been his aesthetic experience on me. Who are the great collectors now, Leo? Well, there are very, very few of uh, uh, of the great uh, collectors uh, remain. Some uh, have faded, like uh, Skull. Uh, others are still alive and kicking, like uh, uh, Dr. Ludwig, and uh, his capacity of buying paintings seems to be limitless. Mm -hmm. He's filled uh, museums uh, all over the world, apart from his own museum in Cologne. There'll be a new building because uh, he has burst uh, the bounds of, uh, of the existing building. He uh, has on paintings on loan all over uh, at the museum in Basel, in, in Vienna, in East uh, Berlin, uh, in Tehran, he had a show now uh, of his uh, mm. selection of his works. The other great collector, very strange, uh, idiosyncratic uh, uh, man, is an Italian, Count uh, Panza, who uh, 
was even more curious than, uh, than, than Ludwig in his uh, collecting. He has a palace uh, in a place called Verese near Milan, beautiful uh, 18th, early 18th century palace. And he just uh, transforms his stables in, in, in art galleries. After exhausting the space that, they had, that he had in the palace itself, he started using the stables, the attic, everything. <laughs> and he has absolutely gigantic uh, uh, works there by, uh, say, Nauman or Sarah or Morris or uh, uh, Wells. <coughs> but uh, up to the most recent manifestations of uh, uh, conceptual art, he has many paintings uh, of uh, Rosenquist's stew that he bought in the early period. Yeah. So are these are the two giants. Uh, there are others, of course very good collections, but there are not many. Great collectors are as rare as, uh, as great painters uh, or great anything. <laughs> How does a businessman from Trieste with a marked interest in philosophy and history end up to be just about the greatest <coughs> salesman, tastemaker of art since the days of Duveen? How did that ever happen to you? Oh, to me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were still talking about Ludwig. <laughs> How did it happen? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I don't know, it just uh, accidentally, I would say, from one thing to the other. <laughs> no, there was that ambition that I always uh, had to understand what uh, art history was about in the past, and then also trying to find out what uh, it was in the present, and also what I could uh, uh, imagine that it would be in the future. It was that idea. Actually, my enterprise uh, in the beginning, when I started uh, the gallery back in '57, was just a search for uh, new, important artists, but especially not artists as individuals so much, but also exploring trends that they belong to, where they came from, what their influences were on them, where a Jasper Johns or a Rauschberg, to begin with, or a Twombly, came out from. Did you ever uh, expect the press to proclaim the pictorial events of the pop art movement the way it did? It was helpful uh, in a certain way to call attention with, uh, to, to the movement, but uh, uh, I don't think that uh, they really uh, understood what they were talking about, frankly. But they called attention to it, and so they permitted this uh, movement really to thrive. There were a few intelligent people who really knew what it was about. and. Uh, the press, really, for the wrong reasons, was uh, very supportive. In the long sweep of history, how do you both feel the pop art movement will be evaluated? What about you? It seems that every new generation thinks wh whatever the press, well, whatever the press has said about and reviews about something that hap happened, the next generation of artists usually has a quite a different take on it and quite it quite it redoes it sort of rethinks it and th thinks of it quite differently so i think the the ideas about something that's called a movement uh aren't uh, it's not stationary i think it 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 changes i think each generation reevaluates it and so then it becomes <coughs> more or less important as time goes goes by so um, I think it's very healthy, too. Thank you, Jim Rosenquist. Thank you, Leo Castelli. And special thanks to you for being with us, too.